All right. All right, good afternoon. I'm Rona Licioco from the Connect and Communicate Series Planning Committee. This session qualifies for one CE credit and the link will be in the chat at the end of the um, presentation. Our presentation will be recorded and made available on the College and Research Division blog and sent to everyone who registered. This session is brought to you by the College and Research Division Board of the Pennsylvania Library Association. I'd like to thank the CRD Board for supporting the Connect and Communicate initiative. If you're not part of the Pennsylvania Library Association but live in Pennsylvania, please consider joining the Pennsylvania Library Association for more great programs and initiatives. Our panelists today will be speaking about creating safe spaces for seeking and creating help. They will discuss the creation of Marshall University Library's mental health initiative and the creative ways they found to engage students and connect people to the resources they need. Our presenters are Sabrina Thomas, Research and Instruction Librarian, Casey Lovelace, Research and Student Success Librarian, Leah Tolliver, Director of the Wellness Program and Women's and Gender Center, and Michelle Alford, the Library um, IT Consultant. During the presentation, feel free to add questions to the chat box. I'll make a list for our panelists. After the presentation, we'll open the floor for attendees to ask questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sabrina Thomas. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar, webinar on creating safe spaces for seeking and creating help. This webinar's intent is to encourage you to utilize tools and resources that you may already have to assist your library users in gaining access to help with mental wellness challenges. We are happy to have here, yeah, we're happy to have you here today. We are joined by Michelle Alford, who is Marshall University Library's IT consultant senior. Her help was instrumental in creating and sustaining the mental health LibGuide. Casey Loveless is our student success librarian and the primary architect for the Mental Health Research Guide, which goes above and beyond what we would traditionally consider a library research guide. We are joined also by Leah Tolliver, who is the director of the Marshall University Student Affairs Wellness Center and Women and Gender Center. Her wealth of knowledge on resources and relationships, both on and off campus in the mental health world, were instrumental in pulling in our diverse expert panelists throughout the year. So my name, once again, is Sabrina Thomas, and I'll be moderator for this webinar. I am a research and instruction librarian at Marshall University and was the chief coordinator for the Mental Health Initiative. I thought it would be, it would be good to begin today by asking how many of you have been affected or have had a loved one affected by mental health challenge or crisis? So I'm just gonna open up the poll. If you can just mark real quick. It looks like the vast majority of us have yes, have said yes. Uh, virtually no one has said no. So it looks like this is both timely and much needed. Uh, we live in a world with enormous problems that can easily feel overwhelming and impressive. Before beginning the mental health initiative, I was challenged by a speaker who asked me to think of one enormous problem facing the world today. Now, in what small way in your corner of the world could you make it better? Specifically, he asked how we could use our own space to improve the world. So in 2017, one large frustrating problem for me was the low representation of women artists in fine art galleries and museums. This led to the first MU Libraries art exhibition titled Nevertheless, She Persisted, which ran the whole spring semester and filled the entire four floors of Drinko Library with art. The exhibition featured women artists that were current and former Marshall faculty students or staff. Due to the success of that spring exhibition, momentum built for the second exhibit. At the same time, I chaired a faculty senate committee called the Student Conduct and Welfare Committee. The Student, Welfare and committee, the Student Conduct and Welfare Committee is concerned with the responsibility for the general and specific well-being of students. 
The function of the committee is to consider and recommend policies relating to the coordination and regulation of student organizations, social events, and other related activities. It is the responsibility of the committee to maintain and improve an atmosphere conductive to the pursuit of academic goals. Much of what I learned or much of what began the mental health initiative stemmed from what I learned from the experts on this committee. This is because one topic that arose over and over again in our meetings was the rise in the students who needed mental health assistance. From what I learned on the committee, I decided that the theme for the next spring exhibition would be called Don't Call Me Crazy, Resiliency Through Art. The stated goal of the art exhibition was to highlight the diverse perspectives of those living with mental health challenges and the family and friends who love and support them. We hoped that this exhibition would be a creative conversation starter on our campus that highlighted the experiences and talents of our students, staff, and faculty. The exhibition was co-sponsored by the School of Art and Design. The artwork once again filled the Drinko Library with artwork and peaked conversation on the topic of mental health. We definitely started a conversation and ultimately an entire initiative. I knew from my work on the Student Conduct and Welfare Committee that our university was doing a great job in burying pockets around campus, but those pockets weren't necessarily communi communicating with one another. Also, students and faculty did not necessarily know where to go to get help both on and off campus. Further, many faculty and staff did not know the cost associated with the varying assistance. For example, as a librarian, I was able to point a student in the direction of help, but I didn't know the varying cost per program. Heartbreakingly, I learned how critically understaffed our counseling service was for the enormous need from the students. We learned that this influx was due to the increasing number of students with high ACE scores. ACE scores, or Adverse Childhood Experiences, in a, is a test to gauge the amount of childhood trauma one has received and how high ACE scores can have profound impacts on adults and adults who are now Marshall students. Because of the amount of students we saw with high ACE scores, the committee wanted, to, wanted the university to become what is called a trauma-informed campus. This is not an official designation that a university can officially obtain by a governing body. Rather, our hope was in, to encourage the campus or encourage a campus where every student knew their ACE score, resiliency score, and faculty knew how to help students with those high ACE scores. We really wanted students and faculty to know where to get help. Overall, we wanted different departments working in mental health to know each other's work, both on and off campus. This seemed like an enormous goal. So what could our libraries do to help? One of the main ways to become a trauma-informed campus include creating an environment in which everyone has knowledge and communication on the impact of trauma and the trauma services provide, provided by the school. Michelle Alford, who knew about this goal, suggested a one-stop place where the campus community, both in person and online, could get help. Further, Michelle suggested a panel presentation or many panel presentations that would gather experts in the field to discuss varying aspects of mental health. In order for this to be done, we would need to combine efforts with the Counseling Center and the Student Affairs Wellness Center. So at this moment, I'd like to stop and take another poll. Have you begun or thought about beginning a mental health initiative in your library? Oh, this one we've got more varying ideas. Well, it looks like we're about even on yes and no's with several that look like that they are not sure. We'll give it a few more minutes. Yes, it looks it looks like there's a majority who a small majority majority who believe the yes that they would, and then a few no, and then third is I don't know. Well, let, well what we're gonna do is tell you what we did, and you can 
see for yourselves if you could is it, if this is something that's right for your library or if aspects of it would be good for your library as well i wanted to let you guys know that organically uh, uh don't call me crazy resilience through art sprung two other aspects of the overall mental health initiative they included don't call me crazy resiliency through education that was the research guide reading list and reading displays as well as panel presentations and don't call me crazy resiliency through community that is the research guide directing people to help um, on campus off campus as well as national hotlines all of these you will hear about later on in this webinar to give you a bit of perspective on our location that is unique specifically to this area, Tanika Phillips, who is a counselor at Marshall University Counseling Services and instrumental in getting the mental health initiative off the ground, shared these thoughts on our students' particular needs. They are that Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia is nestled in the heart of some unique challenges, but with these challenges, come the opportunity to truly provide students with more than just opportunity to obtain a degree. Marshall is focused on graduating students who also have the skills to successfully navigate their daily lives. The demographics of this area adds, makes it no small feat. Due to the amazing collaboration, there continues to be great success. West Virginia, specifically Huntington, West Virginia, has made the news numerous times for alarming rates of fatal drug overdoses, substance use disorders, and abnormally high rates of depression. West Virginia's adverse childhood experiences, or those ACE scores I was referring to earlier, are some of the highest in the nation. From these unique challenges arise some of Marshall University's most successful students. It's often with the resources offered by the university that these students can be successful regardless of their history. Huntington is becoming known as the center of the solution to the opioid epidemic, rather than simply being known as the center of the opioid epidemic. We are no longer in the spotlight for, to just highlight what is going wrong, but other experts are now coming to Huntington, West Virginia, to learn the strategies that are truly making a difference in the lives of individuals and in the community as a whole. Marshall is a huge part of these efforts. While Marshall's efforts extend beyond campus, the on-campus efforts are the focus of today's discussion. With 75 to 80 percent of Marshall's, Marshall University students being from West Virginia, it should come as no surprise that a great majority of these students are impacted either directly or indirectly by the previously identified concerns. Many students are first-generation college students attempting to navigate the college experience on their own while attempting to keep adverse experiences from derailing their education. The usage of Marshall's Counseling Center is steadily increased or has steadily increased over the past five years despite the student population remaining relatively consistent. It is unclear as to if this is due to less barriers to treatments or if it, there continues to be more of a need for the treatment. Nonetheless, the need to expand mental health services to students continues to be a priority at the university. Research continues to show that mental health services on college campuses is one of the greatest ways to increase student retention and academic success. Marshall's collaboration between various resources on campus to focus on mental health initiatives is one of the many ways that Marshall is focused on helping students to have profound impacts on a adults, adults who are now Marshall students. Because of the amount of students we saw with high A scores, the committee wanted the university to become what is called a, oh, sorry, there you go, to succeed beyond regardless of adver adversities that are, may arise on campus with students. Now that you have a bit of a background on Huntington and the Mental Health Initiative, I'd like to bring in our other panelists to begin and begin by asking yeah. Olivia. Yeah. In your unique position, with your experience, what is uh, your process for helping build partnerships? How do you build campus community bridges? Thank you, Sabrina. Um, let me just say it's been a wonderful experience in working on this project with Marshall University librarians. I'm not a librarian, um, and um, through my eyes, it was just wonderful to witness the um, evolution of our campus libraries in my eyes um, to where you know it's a place 
to seek accurate information and data to a place that uh, is actually taking an active role in seeking to identify our community's needs and um, and create um, intentional programming and that uh, that helps provide safe places for people to seek that needed help and support. I think it's just what it was a wonderful project to be on. I've worked on the March University's campus um, in the Division of Student Affairs for about 23 years now. Um, I oversee the women's and gender and more recently have been over um, have responsibilities overseeing the student wellness and uh, which is health student health education programs. And uh, I think probably one of the best things that I could have offered <laughs> was just that I have some really longevity and institutional knowledge. Um, so when you're thinking about doing a project like this, um, bringing in the people that have some real good understanding of the services and the programs that are currently offered on your campus um, and in your community can be very helpful in um, determining who you want to have on your panels or who are the needed people to be at the table um, to decide the, the projection forward with where you want to go with your project. Um, one of the things that I think that was pretty crucial for us is to be able to sit down and take an assessment of who is on our campus right now. We didn't have a lot of money, um, so we needed to know who our experts were um, that uh, we could access readily and with low cost. Um, so some of the things that we did immediately was reach out to the um, offices of student affairs. You know, of course, we were looking at student health education programs, um, the counseling center, the women's and gender center. When we're talking about things around violence prevention, it's important to look at all the special populations that we have on our campus. When you're talking about issues around um, resiliency and trauma, I think it's important to um, look at the uh, additional programs and services that are also available. So the disability services and um, military and veterans affairs were key offices that we that we reached out to. Um, some of the other things that we then progressed to was looking at community agencies and other um, um, academic programs um, in our in our in our relative close area um, in our local immediate area. Um, so of course we looked at the uh, social work department um, and the dietetics and we also worked with our school of medicine um, that was very helpful in identifying experts in the fields that we were wanting to have our panel discussions on. The other thing we have said because we are the uh, opioid, opioid epidemic has been such a uh, prevailing issue for our community. We have some of the new and upcoming programs, um, the Center for Excellence in Recovery and our University Substance Use Recovery Coalition were very, very helpful in establishing some information that we needed um, to be able to uh, work forward with our question development, our development of our questions for the panels and um, making sure we had the right people there to represent all aspects of um, substance use disorders and recovery. And as well as looking at some of the community agencies that have affiliation with the university that maybe aren't part of the university. So we do have our Marshall Health Services, um, which were very helpful in providing expertise and um, members to serve on a panel. And then again, looking at the community and special populations that, um, and making sure that we have representation from those entities as well, such as the, the Veterans Medical Center. The, um, there's lots of community uh, programs. And one of the things that I think was, it was crucial to look at is the different populations of different needs. So you have people in our community who might not be Marshall students. Um, there are uh, different needs that they're struggling with. Some of them, our students also struggle with, but some of them they do not. Uh, so we reached out to the Prestera um, Center for Mental Health Services, which is a community mental health facility, and they were very, very helpful and participated on our panel. Um, the Cabell Huntington um, Hospital Counseling Services as well, and then as also as well as our Cabell um, County Health Department, our local 
Health Department and their harm reduction program. So looking at some of the, the stigma, um, uh, getting services and those programs were, uh, that, that students and our community members can reach out to um, seek um, was very important for us to identify. We have Branches Domestic Violence Shelter, um, which is our local, um, a local uh, domestic violence shelter in, that serves many, more than just our county. Um, and then also the Golden Girls Group Home, which is a um, facility that houses um, students that are, um, are foster care students um, that then we also see uh, matriculate once they go through the program to become students at our on our campus. So these were some of the the, the agencies that we looked at that we um, really worked with when doing the developing our panels and our questions for the panels. I think that it uh, it's just very helpful for you to think about the local resources that you have. Um, in your areas when you're when you're thinking about this and to recognize that many of these people are on your campus. So for the next polling, the next question we have is do you seek out outreach opportunities with departments and agencies um, outside of your library? And I believe I'm not sure if I could, if I will be able to see that I think um, Sabrina might be controlling that, so we'll just all have to wait to see what happens. It looks like the majority, the majority, the majority say yes. Okay, and I think that that is, is I, I hope that you do, um, because I think that's one of the areas that was obviously a strong thing for me to see happen. Happening. you know more people will go to the library on a regular basis um, to seek information than they might designate to go to um, in the counseling center uh, those are the things that's where they can get that information um, having programs like this available panel discussions um, opportunities to submit art those type of things were just such a wonderful experience for our campus and I hope that others will be interested in it as well at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Uh, Michelle, I know that there are, can be stigma, stigma regarding mental health concerns. Can you tell us how you helped encourage audience participation during our panel presentations? Uh, thanks, Leah. One of the big things that uh, we wanted to do was ensure that our audience could participate in the discussion without feeling a fear of either judgment um, or just the kind of discomfort of talking about something very personal such as our mental health uh, and we were able to do an anonymous questionnaire through our spring share uh, software called libwizard uh, this form uh, you'll see the url on the screen uh, was set up so that it was only available during our presentations and the students and attendees would then be able to either in person or if they're watching the live streams of the future um, events could go in put a question in and we were able to have our moderator then present those to our panels um, it was very helpful and we had a, a really good um, bit of feedback from it. Uh, in the next few slides and stuff, we're going to go over the statistics for each of the panels that we've done. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to ask at the end of the session. Uh, the first event we did was anxiety and depression. And this discussion panel had a pretty good turnout of 18 live attendants. Um, we did not have a live stream set up. Um, but it was something we really decided at this point we wanted to do. Um, we did have the anonymous questionnaire up and had at least eight questions that were submitted through that, plus lots of questions that were uh, just spoken aloud. Um, the next event, Trauma and Resiliency, we were able to set up a live feed. Uh, we did this through Facebook Live, but unfortunately due to a, um, battery 
uh, running out. We only got about 30 minutes of footage. Um, so we weren't able to archive it, but there is 30 minutes of that discussion on Facebook Live. Um, if anyone wants to view it, <laughs> we did have a couple of questions submitted uh, online. Lots of people showed up in um, physical presence, but the Facebook post was able to reach a whopping 757 people. Um, of those, 427 actually viewed the video, and there were several reactions, of course. Uh, the next one was our first successful live feed. This is our addiction panel. Uh, we were able to get an hour and 37 minutes of footage. Um, this was a really great panel. Uh, we were able to archive this video, and our uh, users have already uh, downloaded it and viewed it 32 times. Uh, this is through our Marshall Digital Scholar. We had the uh, 11 anonymous questions were brought in. Uh, over 2,700 people were reached by the post, uh, which was pretty amazing to us. Um, 1,300 people viewed the video. And I think the biggest part of the reason this particular panel did so well was that every agency represented on the panel was able to share the link on their own social media and it was very widely shared. I think all, what, I think six or seven different agencies were able to share that link. Um, so it was probably our most successful event. Uh, the next event we did, Disordered Eating, uh, this one turned out really well as well. We didn't have as much live attendance. I think there was only, what was it, maybe nine, ten, yeah, nine or ten in attendance. Um, but the topic was really great discussion. We had great attendance online, so I can't really complain too much. Um, again, 32 downloads from our digital scholar so far. Uh, the final event we did was Autism Awareness. Uh, this one has again been very successful as far as um, future use after the fact. Uh, we've had lots of downloads of the abstracts, we've had lots of views, um, lots of questions people have brought to us because of this. So we've been pretty pleased with the overall impact. Uh, let's see, I think we have a polling question coming up. Yes. Uh, does your library currently use a SpringShare or LibApps product or something similar? Please forgive us if we sound like a SpringShare um, ad, but it was an amazing uh, tool to use for this particular event. Sabrina, can you see the results for that? I sure can. And so far, majority is yes. And 19 people yes, just two people no. And two people similar product, but not exactly spring share. Awesome. Oh. Okay. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to introduce Casey. Um, Casey, while advocating for mental health through education was one of our main goals, uh, how did you utilize our online resources to help us do this? Um, so each element of our initiative was important. The panels, the educational resources um, that we provided, and the opportunity for campus and community members to share how mental health challenges had impacted their lives. But this initiative would have suffered without the appropriate tools to share these resources. We needed a portal where we could bring all of these educational resources together, somewhere we could provide information about the panels and panelists, create awareness about the self-help tools that are available through the library already, and direct students to outside help. So our primary tool for dissemination was the Screen Share Research Guide application LibGuide. Uh, the use of this tool is imperative for proper implementation of our initiative. Uh, we heavily utilize ScreenShare's library platform, including LibGuide, uh, LibInsight, which is how we recorded panel statistics, 
Lib Wizard for creating surveys and allowing anonymous questions during our panel. Um, Lib Answers, which is our Ask and Answer chat widget for connecting students, um, faculty and staff and community members uh, with help from our research librarians at Marshall. And with Lib Powell, which is how we actually um, schedule both research consultations and um, how we schedule uh, research consultations and also how students reserve study rooms. Um, and we also included resources um, in each of those study rooms um, so that uh, students could access them there. We also marketed our study rooms as a place where students could unwind, could decompress, um, and basically you know, sort of get away from you know, the pressures of, of, of school life. Um, so this is the research guide. Uh, on the first page, the home page, uh, the three components of our initiative, um, resiliency through education, resiliency through art, and resiliency through communication are listed, as is pertinent information about the mental health discussion panels. Um, you can see the Ask the Librarian chat widget that appears on almost every page of the research guide. It was important for us uh, that students have as many ways to ask for help as possible and our initiative rationale can also be found here. The next page is the Resiliency Through Education page. You can find panel information, uh, information about the upcoming panel um, that was featured here originally, uh, self-help workbooks uh, that are available through the university's ebook collections, um, as well as information about trainings that are happening in the library. Um, including our uh, Counseling Center's PCR and um, Suicide Prevention Training. Um, there's a recommended reading list. Many of these were compiled by Tanika Phillips. Um, others were relevant titles um, that uh, were already available through NU libraries, such as Appalachian Mental Health and Mental Health Issues and the University Student. Um, subject heading guides for Marshall University Libraries, and our local public library system. Um, if you hover over the Resiliency Through Education tab, it'll give you access to the individual pages that I created after each panel completed. Um, there's a page for, this is the page for our Disordered Eating panel discussion, Finding Health. You can find panelists' biographies, uh, digital signage that we use to promote each event, statistics, uh, the live stream uh, link for the panel, and specific uh, resources related to that topic. Um, these can also be found on the Resiliency Through Community page, but I wanted to make sure that they would be, they could be accessed by topic. Uh, the next tab is where we have housed all information about the art exhibition that was held this year. Don't call me crazy, Resiliency Through Art. The art exhibition ran from January to May, with students submitting their art pieces in late November of last year. I'm going to see if I can get this to go just a little bit louder. This one. Let's see if I can get this to screen. Apologies. Just one moment. Can you hear me any better? Not too much. Okay, I'm, I'm screaming into the microphone. I'm not sure what's wrong with that. My apologies. Um, okay. uh, so this is the, uh, the Resiliency Through Art page. Um, the art exhibition ran from January to May. Uh, submission guidelines were included, and that was the primary use of this page until the exhibition began. Uh, in February of this year, I obtained permission from 13 of our artists uh, to create um, uh, to create a uh, digital presence for the exhibition, which is now the primary use of the Resiliency Through Art page. Um, I wanted to show you some of the pieces that our students, faculty, and staff, and community and members created. Um, it's important to note that several of the pieces in this exhibition were challenged, um, but our president, Dr. Jerome Gilbert, um, considered each of these challenges and ultimately sided with the artists in each case. Uh, 
Um, and finally, the, the last page was the resiliency through community page. And I think this is perhaps the most important page of the guide. This is where all campus, regional, state, and national resources are compiled um, and more are added regularly. Um, originally, it was our intention to have an interactive campus map that would pinpoint where each campus support service is located, uh, but we weren't able to get this idea off the ground. Um, you can also see an example of the educational resources that we included in each of the study rooms at Drinker Library and in other computer labs on campus. Um, so there's a wealth of information from general counseling resources, addiction resources, um, and sexual assault, dating violence, relationship violence, domestic violence, and stalking resources. So Michelle did a fantastic job compiling statistics about our panel discussion. And the only other statistic that I wanted to share is the usage statistics for this mental health research guide. I created this guide in early August of 2018. Since that time, um, the guide has been viewed 2,812 times. Um, and so I talked a lot about the importance of, the, um, of this initiative. And my final thoughts are kind of about implementation. Um, so many of our ideas um, to more thoroughly implement the mental health initiative came as the initiative progressed. The digital exhibition was an afterthought, but was also the most rewarding to work on. Uh, we had marketing submissions from artists, but we hadn't thought to ask for permission to feature their works as a digital collection. Um, so the satisfaction um, surveys we also developed as we progressed and, and realized that we should be using as many of ScreenShare's available tools as possible. Um, so the next um, exhibition um, that will be coming up this spring, I think will be even better because now we know what to ask for from our artists. Uh, we want to create a walking tour of the exhibition uh, with each artist providing commentary on their work. Uh, many of the works were behind glass and all works had already been installed, so there were substantial barriers to photographing the artwork. Uh, next year, um, I hope to recruit someone with far better photography skills than my own. Um, and we can digitize everything before it gets installed. And so I'd like to have say that you, you brainstorm, you plan very thoroughly, but with an initiative like this, uh, one that affects so many, new ideas are going to appear and you just have to be flexible and make room for as many good ideas as possible. And, and that you have the time and the manpower to really undertake. Um, I regularly do as much work on the research guide now as when it was initially created. Um, and uh, you know, or when I was adding to each new panel discussion page. Um, and on the other hand, attempting to do too much or add too much to an initiative underway could lead to burnout. Um, so weigh the importance of additions to the overall initiative and be aware of the effect of doing you know, too much on your own mental health. Casey? Thank you for sharing your, your thoughts on this. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to go back to the rest of the panelists. Oh, I'm sorry, Casey, go ahead. The next polling question is, does your library have access to uh, SpringShare's LibApp suite of products? And yes, looks like the majority have. So at this time, I wanted to take a moment to ask our panelists, uh, what did you learn most from the mental health initiative? And I wanted to start with Michelle. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Um, I think the things that I really took away from this entire experience was that there were so many possible ways to bring awareness of mental health to um, our library and across the university essentially um, we were able to not only do the panel discussions and the live guide but eventually we ended up doing some staff training to help us identify um, at-risk students uh, we did QPR suicide prevention training. Um, we talked about ways to be more mindful of the way we interact with people. 
so that we're a little more attentive to any issues they might be having. Um, we opened up space in the building and encouraged people to use it as a place to relax and, and take a mental break. And we added a couple little events throughout the year where they're doing um, stress relief and stuff to kind of help reduce some of the issues that the students end up having throughout the year. Uh, so it's been really great being able to see so many wonderful things come out of this initiative. Great, thank you. Uh, Leah. Hi, well, what, I guess one of the main things that um, that I came away with, other than how awesome it was to work with you all, um, has, was more about the, um, the need to really be respectful of a diversity and um, being inclusive. We are a panel of white women, and I think it was very crucial for us to stop and take a look at who else we could be bringing to the table. So those are the things that I would, I thought um, that I learned as far as like when we want to do more of this um, is making sure that we have that everybody at the table that we should be having so that we're not um, only thinking from our own lived experiences of what we think would be important to have or who we think would be important to have on the panels or what kind of questions we think would be important to ask of our panel members. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Casey, would you like to share your thoughts on uh, what you learned most from the mental health initiative? I think what I learned most is that we're all impacted by mental health challenges, be they our own, um, loved ones, coworkers, students. Um, and so whether they're, you know, our own challenges or someone else's challenges, um, you know, people often want or need to talk about their trauma. I'm talking about my own trauma has allowed you know, others the space to discuss theirs with me. I'm hearing mental health and medical professionals discuss the very real challenges that so many people face is very validating to individuals. Um, and you know, it makes it feel that they're, you know, for people whose mental health you know, seems like an afterthought or you know, isn't that, much that, they, that, that, that they refer, they can treat with a medical, um, medical uh, treatment. Um, but then also referring for uh, mental health treatment. And the ability to be able to kind of have that communication readily available for medical personnel was, was a, a, a topic of conversation that came up. So there was like a lot of things that can springboard off of just having all these experts at the, at the table, on a panel, having discussions. It was very, it was very um, great experience. Well, thanks. Thank you both. Uh, oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. <laughs> okay. I, I think what I learned most is that you have to speak up and start. Uh, it's so much, there are so many big problems and there seems so overwhelming and it, and it seems like what, are, what can I do in my, in my little spot of the world? And when you think about it, it's just as simple as starting with what you can do. Uh, I tell my kids all the time, don't tell me what you can't do, show me what you can do. Um, and, and that's, that's what I started with. Well, what do we, what do we have an abundance in Drinko Library? We have an abundance of wall space. And then what else do we have that we can work with that we can help people well? Um, there seems to be miscommunication. There seems to be a, a hole in, in knowledge. Well, we we're librarians. We're a library. We can help with this. Is it a is it a complete fix for everything? No, absolutely not. But it is one thing that we can do, rather than talking about what what we we wish the world was like. Um, with this in mind, I just wanted to go around and say, uh, what what is one you want the audience to know before they leave here today and we open it up to questions. What what one thing would you like people to know? Michelle, here's your here's your moment. Um I think that this is to be a cost prohibitive type of um, initiative. Uh, the majority of what we did 
cost little to nothing. Um, all of our panelists were volunteers, none of them were paid. So um, I think this is, it's very doable, even on a shoestring budget. Thank you. Uh, Leah. I think one of the things that um, I came away with was that, uh, that it doesn't take, um, you know, doing, it, I think it's really important that to make a real change happen in a community, that's not just one person doing something really big, that it's a lot of people working together to make that, that one small change of stepping up, speaking out, taking the initiative. So I think my, my takeaway or, or the thing that I would love for everybody to know is that it, doing things like this, to depending on the scale you want to do it at, I mean, it's, it's doable and it's needed. And to have the opportunities um, there on your campus or in your library um, can make a huge difference. Even if it's just a one person, that has a huge ripple effect. And I would encourage everybody to think ways they can do things like this. Thank you, Leah. Uh, how about you, Casey? Um, am I, I think I just want everyone to know that outreach is not as scary as you think it is. When you have passionate people and um, you know passionate organizations um, that you're contacting um, who want to have the same goals and want the same things that you do, um, it's very surprising how easy it is to get others to step up and you know, be willing to help and you know chip in on the effort. Thank you. Um, my final, the one thing I would want people to know is to do things even if it's scary even if it you don't know like when we started this i had no idea if people would bring artwork uh there's lots of reasons why they would not bring artwork none of our artwork is insured we can't uh, afford that so uh yet people brought artwork i didn't know if anyone would agree to volunteer to be on a, a panel and yet people came I didn't know if people would show up to the panel presentations and they did. And we got an amazing amount of, of positive feedback online. So in all of these, I think there is some risk. You never know if you're gonna deal with the work and if people will show up or whether it will be needed. But many of those panel presentations, the questions that were asked by students um, and faculty and community members really helped them because they had access to experts at that time where they needed it. So we were able to do some good. Uh, at this moment, I realized that we are, we wanted to leave a lot of time left over to ask questions. So if anyone would like to jump on and ask questions, just if you add them to the chat, I'll read them out and uh, we can answer them. Could you provide any kind of estimate on how much time you spent on this project? Well, I think that would depend on the person. That's a good question as far as if you take everything, um, the artwork, understand that I had a lot of help. I had a lot of help from the art design. I would say, you know, it wasn't compared, the because the the, we used to have displays that would go up every month and then we'd have to take down every month. And when I did a giant exhibition, yes, there was more hours in the beginning, but because that display stays up the entire semester, it's ultimately less work. I, I don't know, it's hard to estimate, but it wasn't over overwhelming or, and, and only it wasn't overwhelming because of the amount of help that I received. I, um, that's that word I always forget, but I, I gave a lot of a lot of jobs away. Delegate. <laughs> Delegate. Thank you, Michelle. What, You're welcome. What do you think? How much time did you spend on this? Uh, with setting up the panels and stuff, I, I don't think we spent more than maybe, I don't know, maybe five hours a piece setting them up, contacting people, um, requesting signage um putting them up on social media 
I mean, there, there wasn't really a huge sink of time for each of those events. Um, and each, we probably put what, maybe two, three hours of actual time where we were, you know, setting up the room and doing the presentation and then breaking down the room. So that yeah. really wasn't bad. I would say on average about five, maybe seven hours per panel and we did a total of five for that uh, for that year. Casey, how much time do you think you spent on the research guide? That's a really hard thing to estimate, but I, I would say probably somewhere between 30 and 40 hours total, all, all told since I started the research guide. Leah, do you have any idea of an estimate of time? Um, well, I, I'm not really sure. I think some of this, you know, coming up, I know prior, when we very first started, um, one of the things that we were charged with was C committee. Um, she was the interim director for the counseling center on campus and her, um, you know, coming up with the, the, Suggest, suggested readings and the resources and those type of things. Um, you know, I, I would say that there was some pre, even before every meeting planning meeting we had, we had some pre-work that we were doing. So you, there would be, you know, a couple hours of, of work before that. I'm sorry, I really just don't have, a, you know, a main idea, but I know that we probably put in, you know, probably a good, 10 hours of work and just trying to, you know, get things ready for the, the planning meetings of all the ones that we had before the event started. Not crazy. It was definitely doable. Awesome. Uh, what other questions do, do, does the audience have today? Wow. This is this is Erin. I just wanted to remind everybody um, who's left that the forms for um, the evaluation of the session um, and if you wanted the continuing education credit are in the chat box um, while you're thinking of other questions at this time. I, but see, oh, I see we have a question. Could you provide any kind of estimate of how much you, oh, nope, that's the same question. Yeah, Beth just said thank you so much for the session and answering her question. Thank you. I, I do want to say that this is the one thing that the Mental Health Initiative did was it highlighted that the, the library is a hub of communication. Uh, that so often we're seen as um, more of a, a repository of information. And this, this demonstrated that the library is a, a brick and mortar space still is very much relevant in the sense that it's a, a meeting of place to get help where you can physically come and get help and talk personally with with experts um which was really gratifying so in other words it was worth it was worth the time it was absolutely worth the time any other questions Hi, this is Rona Lee. Um, I'm going to wrap up everything, but I have a question first. Um, uh, you mentioned that some of the artwork was challenged by, um, and I just had an, uh, I was interested in who challenged it and whether you've had problems with challenges in other exhibits. You said you've done a lot of exhibits and do you think it's this topic? Oh no, uh, we, we have had other uh, challenges, um, but uh, everything from someone just saying, hey, could you take this down? Um, it offends me to, uh, th there were ones where the, it was a student who complained to our associate dean and then uh, another who ultimately complained to the president. Um, we handle it how we handle it, which is intellectual freedom. We have our own disclaimer. Um, we, now we have a very specific policy to go along with that disclaimer. Um, but fortunately, President Gilbert uh, was able to come by and view it. And we ultimately were uh, 
during the opening uh, ceremony. We always have an opening celebration for these uh, the art exhibitions, and I gave those artists um, and one other artist, but those artists who were challenged, uh, able I was able to give them a platform so they could discuss their artwork. Uh, and I also invited those who challenged the artwork to come to the opening. Um, so, it, so far, it, yes, there, there is, it's, it's, I want to hear um, challenges and criticism so that we can have an open dialogue. What I don't want to have is a, a silencing where, where people don't feel free to voice concerns. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, <laughs> that information. Yeah. So um, are there any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat box. Um, so I'm um, and we're getting close to two o'clock. So I'd like to thank all of you so much for with, for sharing with us today. And all the participants who are in there. Aaron has put the link for the eval form and the CE credit form in the chat box. So please take a look at those. Um, I hope everyone will take a few moments to complete our evaluation form and let us know your thoughts about the presentation and about our programming in general. Um, if you registered for a group for today's session, you'll receive an email with a link to the survey. And if you would, please share the link with the members of your group. Again, the feedback we receive helps us determine in what direction to take our programming. As a reminder, the recording of this presentation will be shared to those who registered, so feel free to forward it. It will also be on the CRD blog. If you're not a Pennsylvania Library Association member and you're interested in becoming a member, please feel free to email Erin Burns at emb28 at psu.edu and she'll have the appropriate person contact you. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Thank you everybody. We really appreciate you, you uh, asking us to uh, present today. I uh, hope everyone has, has a great day.